All right, bless. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) We're so happy you're here. One line in this film that I took notice of was someone talking about Billie Holiday saying she looks like a million bucks, but she feels like nobody. And I wonder, I would imagine that would have been a way into understanding her. How did you go about kind of really wrapping your head around the character of Billie and and what she was going through specifically during the the time where you play her? Yeah, um, you know, I I guess my way in um, was, well, first of all, Lee is just brilliant. And as as, um, Riz also said, just just an honor to be here and to be I'm acknowledged among all these incredibly talented people in this world. And, um, but, but yeah, I, I think, you know, Lee connected me with this amazing acting coach, Tasha Smith, and this amazing dialect coach. And, you know, cause I didn't have sort of this a frame of reference or an idea of, you know, I, I'm, I'm a researcher, right? I'm typical kind of Capricorn in that way. <laughs> so I want all of the information, but, you know, she really helped me to say, okay, you have to fill all of that research with a human being, a real human being that comes from you. And um, that was a really scary idea for me. But, you know, I, I think to sort of sum it all up, the, the similarities between Billie Holiday and myself are that we are both black women living in America. And that has its own inherent set of sort of like invisibility and traumas and um, sort of this need to just prove your worth and to prove that you are valuable and that you're here and that you should be seen. and. Um, and, I, and I think it also comes with this sort of idea that we present our strongest selves to people, even if inside we're feeling terror and we're feeling not good enough because society has often, you know, it has been sort of fashioned to kind of make us feel that way. And so we have to constantly overcome these ideas um, about ourselves. Uh, so I, I think that was definitely a way into into the character and and then just fear. Honestly, I was terrified <laughs> of doing this movie and I was like sure that I would be a stain on her legacy. And I was like, I am not an actor. This is a terrible idea. I'm about to fuck it all up. Or I'm sorry to do this. But um, you know, and so that fear really, I mean, interestingly enough, I think it really informed the character because I'm sure that's how she felt every time she got on stage and sang Strange Fruit and was fighting for equality and to hold a mirror up to America, that's a dangerous thing to do, you know, so I think those, yeah. were, those were some of the ways where I was able to find my way. You mentioned Lee Daniels and you mentioned the fear. This decision for, to cast you and also for you to take this role on required a leap of faith on both of your parts. And I was fascinated to read that Lee was, I guess, reluctant to meet with you because you hadn't acted before. Did you know that? when you ended up meeting with him that he wasn't sure he even wanted to meet you? Or did you find that out after the fact? Uh, I think we both sort of found it out after the fact. And I think we both kind of informed each other of it. (laughs) So we both went into that first meeting being like, why are we here? Why are we meeting with each other? (laughs) I was like, I don't want to do this. This is a terrible idea. And he was like, I don't want to meet her. She's not an actor. And so I, I didn't know. It was just for me, the incentive was like, all right, you know, this is not a good idea. I know I'm going to say no to this, but you know, if he really wants to meet, like, you know, the, the thing is your people will pose it to you a little bit differently. So our managers kind of pushed us on each other. Right. So it's like, she really wants to meet you. He really wants to meet you, you know, like liars, but <laughs> I'm glad they did. Uh, but you know, so we're both kind of sitting in this meeting, like, all right, what are we doing here? But it was kind of love at first sight. I think there was something about that mutual fear, right? Cause the fear really stemmed from, our own personal insecurities and we really bonded over that. And then a desire to really honor Billie Holiday and her story. I had been a fan of hers for a long time and and I wanted the true story of her life told even though I'm certain I should not be the one to do it. <laughs> uh, and he, I could see for him, he was, uh, he was a huge, huge fan of Lady Sings the Blues as well as myself. Um, but he, you could tell that he had this chip on his shoulder that he felt slighted that the government was able to successfully keep the true story of the holiday fighting for integration and equality and talking about lynching and racial terror in America and just sort of making um, uh, people who may not have known privy to these things. So he hated that. He didn't know that about her, you know, and so you could tell he had this chip on his shoulder. He really wanted to tell the story. And the idea of vindicating her legacy is sort of what was the catalyst that made me go, okay, you know, our audition for this, you know? So yeah, it was sort of a gradual leap of faith for for both of us. 
I also want to ask you one question that I'm sure you've been asked many times, but I haven't heard the answer. So I'm going to take the opportunity to, to ask okay. because you are a singer where, where does your voice and where do your voice and Billy's voice converge? How did you find that? How did, how did you have to turn off certain aspects of your own natural singing voice in order to turn yeah. her on? And what was that like? Uh, you know, it was an, an, it was a, an emotional and a physical thing, you know, right? I, I am a big fan of Billie Holiday's and I've been since I was 11 years old. Um, and my, my huge thing, what I loved about her was, was her tone and her phrasing. You know, she is, she's really, you know, like the, the queen of jazz. She is really the mother of jazz music because of her phrasing, right? She never sang anything exactly the same. And so for me as a singer, at that young of an age to hear the difference in her tone. She didn't sound anything like Whitney Houston or Aretha Franklin or Gladys Knight or, you know, all of these singers that I, I grew up listening to and loving, um, but she was the greatest jazz singer. And so, and I was enamored by her voice. So she really changed my idea of what a great singer was. So the phrasing was a huge part as far as the singing voice um, and, and then tone and tone was sort of like, okay, how do I get there? Cause I'm always much more in my chest and Billy is in her head, like behind her ears. And so there was muscle memory. It was uh, my dialect coach, Tom Jones. I found my way into her through her laugh. And then he helped me find my way into her through her breath, you know, how she would chase her breath and the places she would speak from. So she was in her head behind her ears. There was all this gravel and her, her voice didn't often travel into her chest, you know, but when it would, it would go deep, you know, pass through all this gravel into her head and then <laughs> out of her mouth, which sounds a little crazy, but that's the anatomy of it, right? Or what we found. So it was muscle memory, you know, training to do that, <laughs> making my mother uncomfortable every day. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, then, and then it was a physical transformation, right? You know, it was, you know, um, I, I don't really, I, I try to take care of my voice. I try to, you know, wear scarves and not being cold weather and drink hot tea. And I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke cigarettes. I, I don't. You know, it, but it was so sort of really putting my body through it. I started smoking, uh, chain smoking, and drinking so much gin, <laughs> um, and 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 then not taking care of my voice. Um, you know, just just definitely being louder, more boisterous, um, not really covering up, and not exercising it, and cold drinks, not hot tea. You know, so it's, it it had to be both physical. I had to earn in a very short period of time what Billy earned in a period of forty four years. You know, so there's there's a lot of information written on her vocal tone and that had to be exactly right you know but not an impersonation well, was, of course it was magical to watch andra and i'm so happy that uh so many people are really responding to it so many congratulations and again thank you and we'll see you in a few minutes okay thank you